We, we, we've been in the book of Amos for seven weeks already. We're in our eighth. Next week's our last week in the book of Amos. And Amos, poor guy, he's given the job to take a message nobody wants to hear and take it to a people that do not really like him. He's from the southern kingdom of Judah, and he's going to the northern kingdom of Israel, and he's telling them that a lion is roaring from Jerusalem. The lion is the Lord. He tells us a little later in the, second, in the third chapter, actually, that does a lion roar when there is no prey? And what he is really saying is, the Lord is roaring against Israel because Israel is on the verge of impending doom. Imagine during the Civil War times that you are a Yankee and it's pre-Civil War and, and you're going to take your message of abolition down to the south. How do you suppose you would be greeted? Not very well. That's poor Amos. He was drafted for this job. He didn't even want it. He was a farmer. He was a fig picker. He was a shepherd. And God called him to do that task. This book has been politically charged because he's, he's got to challenge a nation. And so it starts off, did a lion just roar? Yes, the Lord has roared from Jerusalem. The second lesson that we learn from the, the book of Amos is three strikes and you're out. Now, he didn't say it that way. He said for three sins and even for four, judgment is coming on you. That idiom is like three strikes and you're out. God is throwing these fastballs and he has struck out every nation that surrounded the nation of Israel and each one goes down swinging into judgment and doom and then he zeroes in on Judah itself and he strikes them out because they rejected the word of the Lord. Wow, that's a dangerous thing to reject God's word. Israel is happy because all of their enemies have been struck out by God, and then all of a sudden God says, okay, Israel, you're up to bat, and he strikes them out too. He says, you have blasphemed the name of the Lord. You are out of here. Judgment comes. Judgment comes. We get to the third chapter, and we find that he says, uh, he's got a message, hear, O Israel, your Lord. Hear, O Israel. God is calling, Israel, are you listening? He says, I have chosen you out of all the nations of the earth, and yet you have not walked with me. Can two walk together except they be agreed? I am not lowering my standards to your level. You've got to come up to my level if you want to walk with me. They weren't walking with the Lord, so judgment was coming. Poor Amos has got to preach this message, and he turns to the avoidable, avoiding respectable sins because they had these respectable sins. They were living in luxury at the expense of the poor. They were living in complacency, didn't want to do anything about it. They're living in things that have become very respectable. If you might recall, I listed the early church respectable sins. They were called the seven deadly sins. And then I turned to modern seven deadly sins that are all around us. They're respectable because we don't speak out about them. We just accept them as being okay, the status quo. But God says, that's not right. In fact, the chapter ends by saying, prepare to meet your God. Whoa, whoa. He turns at that point, there is a way to avoid coming disaster. And so we see in the fifth chapter that Amos says, Seek the word. You need your Bible. Get in the Bible. Seek the word. And then he says after that two times, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. There's a solution to every problem. It's found in the word of God. And God speaks through his word. And God is the one that you want to seek through the pages of the scriptures. And he winds up ending that chapter saying, seek the good. Just do what is right. And do what is right. We come to the sixth chapter, and he's got a woe. He says woe. Woe is a, one little word, woe. It means despair, doom. We talked about how Isaiah, the prophet, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple in his vision uh, from his garment that, that came down from his throne. And there were two angels, their seraphim, and, and they were crying back and forth to each other, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. The earthquake shook the temple, and, and Isaiah saw the Lord in all his glory, and he said, whoa. 
I'm ruined. I'm doomed. I'm a sinful man with unclean lips in the presence of an all-holy God. Woe. That's a sense that you get when in your sin you stand before God. Woe. Amos has heard from the word of the Lord, and he doesn't say, woe is me. He says to his audience, woe to you. To you. You are an unclean people in the presence of an all-holy God. Woe to you. His message is one that they do not like. And so we wound up last week with, help, I'm struggling here, Lord. Because the Lord shows him three visions. Boom, boom, boom. The first vision of the locust plague that strips the land. After the king has already gotten his crops, then he strips the land so the people have nothing to eat. And he says, Lord, he intervenes, he prays. He's a, a mediating between the people and God. And he prays and says, Israel is so small, Lord. They're, they're going to vanish. And the Lord relented because he prayed. There is power in prayer. The second vision was a fire. A fire comes in and it dries up everything. It even dries up the water everywhere. And he said, whoa, Lord, please help. Israel is so small. And the Lord relents. He said, it won't happen. It won't happen. Then the third vision, there's a man. It's the Lord himself. And he's got a plumb line. He's standing on a wall, but the wall is set straight. And he drops that plumb line and it's true. And the Bible is our plumb line. And the Lord drops that along our lives. And are we out of kilter from the word of God? He wants us to be true. And he says, judgment is not going to be halted this time. Don't bother to pray. Because you don't want me to change my standards. Judgment is going to fall. He was struggling with the Lord and the vision and the message that he had given him to have to preach to his people but he was also struggling with the authorities who were in charge. Amaziah, the priest at Bethel in the northern kingdom, accuses him of conspiring against the king from his preaching. You see, when the preacher preaches the word of God, some people just don't like it. It's true. It's true. They didn't like what he was preaching, so you know what they did? They said, well, we'll fix that. We'll just get rid of him. We'll send him back to where he came from. So they tell Amaziah, and tells him, leave. Go back to where you came from. Go back to your farm. Go back to shepherding sheep and picking figs. And he responds, I didn't want this job. I was happy picking figs. I, I was happy shepherding taking care of sheep. But God called me, and I can't do anything but what God wants me to do. And then he pronounces a terrible curse upon those who are challenging the preacher. It's right there in the text. It's right there in the text. I don't normally do a long introduction like that, a little review. But it kind of brings us right up to pace where we're at today in chapter 8. Avoiding a bitter end. Avoiding a bitter end. I find that in verse uh, 10 of this chapter, verse eight, uh, uh, chapter 8. I will make that time like a bitter day. That time that is coming is going to be bitter. It, it, he's already warned them. Don't say, oh, the day of the Lord's coming is going to be a wonderful time because it's not. It's going to be first met with judgment. I will make that time like a bitter day like going over the precipice here. I don't know if you'd want to be on that train going across those tracks up in the mountains and find out, whoops, there's no more track ahead. Amos put it this way. Here's the fact that there's a bitter end coming. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me, a basket of ripe fruit. And the reason he picks this vision God shows this vision to them is because they are ripe for judgment back then. They were ripe for judgment. That's what his whole book up to this point has been about. You, you need to walk with the Lord, not, not without him. Prepare to meet God. You need to change. You need to have a heart for justice, not all your injustice. 
They were ripe for judgment back then. This is what he says. What do you see, Amos? The Lord asks. He responds, a basket of ripe fruit. That's what he answers. Then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe. For my people Israel, I will spare them no longer. In the New Testament, it says judgment must begin in the house of the Lord, the house of God. My people need to live according to my standards and my precepts. Or don't call yourself my people. What he is saying here is, in that day, declares the sovereign Lord, the song in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung. This is looking forward to when Sennacherib or the Assyrians come invading from Assyria and they destroy the northern kingdom and take them captive. He says there's going to be bodies everywhere. And then it says silence. The word is like our word, hush. Don't say a word. Somebody might be so bold as to say, shut up. Take that in. Judgment is coming. You are going to be accountable. There are consequences for your actions. Think about that for a moment, he says. Whoa. They were ripe then. Are we ripe now is the question. Is America ripe for judgment? I mean, do we, do we just read this and say, oh, there's no application to the Bible to today? No, of course not. Is America ripe for judgment? You tell me. Look it. God has been removed from our schools, has he not? And so instead today they teach them everything that is usually opposite to the precepts and the standards of the Bible in our schools today, don't they? They do. The destruction of marriage. You know, you don't even have to be at fault for marriage today uh, to get a divorce. I mean, if you just decide, you know what, you burnt my toast this morning. I am tired of having burnt toast. Out of here. You know it's true. It's the destruction of marriage in America. There's a breakdown of the family. There's father absent homes. And on Father's Day, and we're going to address that just a little bit, the impact of a father is most profound. Women have to nurture and nurture and nurture and nurture. A man just has to show up. It's true. Statistics are going to bear this out. Children want a father in their home and in their life. They want that man. I'm not trying to play down motherhood at all. But we've taken out of the family the most important ingredient, a father in America. Abortion is on demand. It used to be, oh, for the health and the safety of a mother. If, if it's between the baby and the child, and this has just been a slippery slope, it's just really murder in the womb. We know that. Every person is made in the image of God. John the Baptist, in the womb, leapt for joy. He had emotional experiences. If you were to watch an abortion uh, on a sonographing machine, you would see the baby struggling for its own life in the womb and as they tear it apart to abort it. And, and this is just status quo in America today. Homosexuality is celebrated. It is such an acceptable sin. We were watching a program where the guy said, because he's going to be fired uh, from his job, he said, yeah, but I'm gay. And he said, oh, that's so old passe. It's into transgenders now. It doesn't hold up. It's, that, is, that is just so accepted by society. And yet the word of God is very clear that God created us, male and female. Gay marriage has been legalized, desecrating the institution that God created when he brought Adam and Eve together as one. 
and made them one flesh. That marriage is between a male and a female. We desecrate God's institutions? Listen, gender identity, there's a crisis in America. You know what this really is? It's the compromising of science. You ask any scientist or biologist, you ask them, how many sexes are there? There's only two. You either have an XX chromosome or you have an XY chromosome. There are no Zs. There are none. And when they do this to a child, it renders them sterile. It's never be able to have kids again. Is it done? I call that child abuse. Child abuse. It is a violent child abuse, transsexual operation on kids. So I ask you, you tell me, are we about to go over the edge as a nation? Ooh, you tell me. I'm asking this, are we ripe like they were ripe for the judgment hand of God upon a nation? I don't have to tell you. you. You answer that question yourself. You answer that question. The reason back then for a bitter end was the abuse of the vulnerable. Abusing the vulnerable. Hear this. You who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land. Some of you have been in third world countries. I've been in third world countries. Our poorest people in America are rich in those third world countries. Come on, let's face it. But do we have needy? I'll tell you, who are the needy in our nation? I'll tell you who are the needy. Those unborn babies are the needy. They need support. They need life flow. They, they, they need, they're the needy, and yet we trample them. We discard them. We destroy them. And, and people say, Pastor, why are you always talking about this? Because it's a national sin. If I'd lived prior to the Civil War, I would have probably been preaching abolition. You probably said, Pastor, you keep bringing it up. Of course I would. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. How long do we blatantly do these things against the Lord and not expect him to visit our country with judgment? That's Amos. That's his message. Then it's his message now. The reason for this bitter end is the abuse of worship. They were saying, when will the new moon be over? I just can't wait to get over this religious holiday so I can get back to my business. You see, they were going through all the motions, but they really didn't mean the motions of the religion they were involved in. All they cared about was getting on to getting to work on Monday and making their buck. He says, when will the new moon be over the celebration that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? It's all about money, money, money. Sound like America today? Big corporations today? How about the average person on the street? Of course. Um, why would I get a job if the government is going to give me free money that's more than the money that I make when I'm working? You want to know why? Because work is good. Six days shall you labor, and on the seventh day I'll give you rest. What? <clears throat> it's not the money. I work because God created me to work. All the major, strong, industrialized nations of the world were Protestant because they had the Protestant work ethic, which says work is good. And the American culture today, it's fun is good. Entertainment is good. Work, it's an evil. It's, it's an evil, a necessary evil. I got to do it so I, I can go have fun. And now, why would I work? Because they're going to give me free money. You see what's going on? That's what they were all about. Abuse of worship. They weren't even, you see, worship is more than just what we do on Sunday. 
Worship is my attitude towards God all, all week long. It's my attitude towards work. My attitude towards work. Whatsoever you do, do it all for the glory of God, the New Testament says. Whatever you do, you've got to do it for the glory of God. It was abuse of business. They were skimping on the measures. Hey, folks. I went to the refrigerator, and I swear a half a gallon keeps getting smaller and smaller in the ice cream carton. In fact, I'm not even sure they call it a half gallon anymore. In fact, sometimes I'm confused with the pint size and the half gallon. Why? They're skimping on the measures. That's what they're doing. Boosting the price. The price even goes up and I get less and and I'm supposed to be happy because I like my chocolate ice cream. (laughs) I still buy it. They're cheating with dishonest scales. They give give the people they like a true scale. But if they don't like it, they're going to weight them differently. Buying poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals or taking advantage of the vulnerable, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. So you go in to get some wheat, and oh, they don't like you, so they sweep it on and get a little dirt and dust in there because you know that's going to weigh a little bit more, and they put it on your side of the scale. You, you You get the worst of it, and it weighs the most. You pay the high dollar for the crummiest part. I wouldn't put that against any business practice today. Don't you always, when you, when you drop your vehicle off at some place for repair, wondering if they're really repairing what needs to be repaired or adding on? Because you don't know. You don't have the computer to diagnose it. Don't you, don't you walk away sometimes with that little question in your mind, or am I the only one? No, no you do it too. You do it too. That's what's going on in their day. He then turns to the promise. That God is promising there is a better day coming. He is promising this. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. Notice that the text capitalizes the word pride because it is the name of God here. The Lord has sworn by Jacob's pride, which is the Lord. He's the pride of Jacob. When God could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, it says in the New Testament. He is swearing by himself, so you know that God cannot contradict himself, so he says, I will never forget anything they have done. My wife will say to me, did you set the alarm? And then I'll think, yeah, I did. And she'll say, oh, I don't think you did. And then we go verify it. You see, I forgot, but I thought that I did. Well, listen, God never forgot a thing ever, ever, ever. He is omniscient. He knows it all. You are not going to be able on that day when you stand and give an account for what you've done in your life to say, ah, um, no, I don't think I did that. He's going to say, oh, yes, you did. I said, in fact, every mouth will be completely stopped. You won't even be able to say, oh, but... It's not, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. God forgets nothing of what you've done. And so he says to them, listen. He asks it in the form of this question. Will not the land tremble for this? See, he's throwing the question back to them like I did to you earlier. Is America ripe for judgment? He said, hey, will the land not tremble for this? For all that you've been doing? And all those who live in it mourn, the whole land will rise like the Nile. Do you wonder how much the Nile rises? The Nile rises 45 feet. That's taller than the ceiling. Watch what it says. There's going to be an earthquake when the ground they're standing on is going to rise that high, and then it's going to come crashing right back down. It will be stirred while it's up there, shaking like crazy. And then it's going to sink like the Nile all the way down to 45 feet. Now, I was in a small earthquake in Alaska, and all the dishes in the cabinets were shaking. I could hear them. It woke me up out of my sleep. But it was nothing like this. It was nothing like this. He says, you're you're going to experience a shaking. But listen, 
Those who are in the kingdom of God, who really know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, listen to this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we are members of the kingdom of God. Jesus told Nicodemus, when you're born again, you're born into the kingdom of God. A man will not see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. When you're born again, you are a part of an unshakable kingdom. Israel was going to be shaken. But your life doesn't have to be shaken. He says, I'm a part. I've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Isn't that what we pray for? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. One day I'm going to be in that kingdom, literally, physically, and it will never be shaken. But they're going to have a shaken kingdom. He says, in that day of calamity, when, when, when the Samaria is being overrun by the Assyrians, he said, declares the Lord, in that day, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. That was just a precursor of in that day of the tribulation period, where there's going to be a time of darkness. We saw that in the fifth chapter of this book. It's going to be a time of utter darkness. He says, but you, brothers, are not in darkness. The Christian, you're not in darkness. That you should be a part of a day like that. It should surprise you like a thief. No. You're all sons of light and sons of the day. You don't have to be under the judgment hand of God. You don't have to be if you know Jesus as your Savior. He says, it's going to be a time of mourning. I will turn the religious feasts into mourning and all your, your singing into weeping. And I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. And I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. Oh, there's that bitter end. That bitter end. The gravestone here is actually an angel on top of the grave, right? The metaphor here that he's using is you lost your only son. It's kind of like Pharaoh. Pharaoh would not turn his heart. He kept turning it away from the Lord. Kept turning it away from the Lord. Kept turning it away from the Lord. And finally, the tenth plague cost him his own son. And then he finally let the people go, and then he changed his mind after that. He had such a wicked heart. It's a day of mourning coming. But listen, it doesn't have to be that way for the Christian. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Wow. Wow. A time of famine is coming. Oh, wow. listen to this. this. This is a famine like no other famine. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. So I got Psalm 1 on there. You know what's going to happen? It's going to disappear. They're going to want to hear from God, and God's going to say, mm, time's up. I'm not speaking to you any longer. Whoa. Whoa. God is not going to speak to them any longer. He's just going to leave them go their own little way. That's why it's so important for us who are Christians to hide God's word in our hearts that I might not sin against you. We used to have what the kids, when my kids were younger, a little competition called the verse down. Anybody know what a verse down is? Raise your hand, verse down. You don't know what a verse down is. You get two kids up, and the one quotes a verse. And then the other kid has to quote the verse. Not that verse, any verse. And then the other one goes back and forth until they can't think of another verse that they can quote. And the one left standing is the winner. I wonder for a moment, if we did a verse down, how many verses could you quote? The Bible says we hide the word of God in our hearts so that we don't sin against God. A day will come when you won't be able to put your hands on the Bible. I, I, I'm so glad I live when I live. I can read it on a paper copy. I can read it on my computer. I can read it on my phone. I can click the little button on my phone, and my phone will read it to me. Whoa, is this great? And still, we live in the most illiterate scripture memorization time ever. You realize that the early church, they didn't have Bibles. They came, they listened to every word, and they would memorize it, memorize it, memorize it. 
They memorize more scriptures than we do today, and we're in the information age. There was a famine of the word of God, and they weren't going to be able to find it. A day might come when you can't find it because you didn't memorize it, and you're going to say, where is that verse to support me in what I'm going through? And you won't find it because you don't know it. Men will stagger from sea to sea, wandering to the north and the east, searching for the word of the Lord, uh, and they just can't get a signal. <laughs> I can't get that verse on my Bible, that, that Bible verse on my phone. I can't get it. They're lost. And they will not be able to find it. Listen to this. But those who know the Lord, they will ask and it will be given to them. If you seek, you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Hey, listen, we don't have to be lost. We come to Jesus and we can be found. In that day of catastrophe, a lovely young woman or women and strong young men will faint because of their thirst for the word of God. They're going to faint. But Isaiah says this, but those who wait for the Lord, you see, you're on one side or the other. You're on one side or the other. You're either all for him or you're not with him at all. You're out of step. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Not faint. Talk spiritually. They'll be strong for every occasion, strong for every occasion. Those who swear by the shame of Samaria, that's their idols of Samaria, uh, who, or who say, surely as your God, small g, God live, O Dan, and that was a golden calf that was set up years ago, and Dan and, uh, and up at Beth, uh, uh, both at Dan and Bethel, and, and he says here, O Dan, as surely as the God of Beersheba, Beersheba was a place where they did their pilgrimages from there up to uh, uh, Bethel, and he says, that, and to Dan, they would do their pilgrimages there, and it was all about idolatry. He says, surely they will fall never to rise again. If you were to look in Colossians chapter 3, you would find most people think they're, they're not idolatrous, they're not idolaters. But in Colossians chapter 3, it says this, covetousness, which is idolatry. When you covet, you are an idolater because you want something that God has not chosen to give you. Woo! We are an idolatrous nation. They have fallen never to rise again. But listen, it says, be all the more eager to make your calling that God has called you and your election sure that he has chosen you. How do you do that? You accept Christ and you live for him. For if you do these things, you will never fall never. You put him first in your life. All right, so how should we respond to bitter days ahead? I want to wrap this chapter up. How should we respond? First of all, don't be surprised. America is ripe too. You've already said that in your minds. America is ripe. So we shouldn't be surprised. But at the same time, God has raised us up as a people of God for such a time as this, that we are to be living witnesses, the light of the world to those who are lost in darkness. But don't be surprised. Secondly, understand that God has a reason for these bitter days. We have turned away from biblical precepts and principles. We're doing our own thing, and it's bitterness that's going to come in the end. It is. God has his reason. God never forgets. You've got to keep that in mind. God never forgets. Never, ever forgets. And you need to hide God's word in your heart. You need to memorize scripture. You need to. If you, if you just, mem- just mull over it all day long, you just keep rereading that passage, reread it, reread it. There's some passages I didn't even intend to memorize, but I've read them over so many times, I know what they are, and I can quote them. Repetition is the key to all learning. Read the word. Listen to the word. Wait upon the Lord. 
Don't wait upon our government. Don't wait upon your spouse. Don't wait on your kids. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. All right, so is there any way that we can stop going over the precipice? Is there any way? And I want to suggest, yes, there is. We quote this several times. If my people, who's that? The Christian, genuine Christian, real Christians, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. We talk to God about it. We talk to God about it. And seek my face. But as we pointed out last time, you don't just pray. You've got to turn from your own wicked ways. You've, you've got to have revival start in you before you can ever expect it to start anywhere else. He said, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. You see, if you pray and you repent, the Lord will put a bumper out there at no train. No train can go, go past. It'll be a Lord's bumper. We need to pray that. You see, Jesus put it this way. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the rest will be added to you. Wow. Seek him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper, we need to examine our own hearts and see how are we contributing to our nation's mess that it's in. Lord, we're so very thankful that you're patient and long-suffering, but we have found from the scriptures all of that, too, comes to an end. May we, Lord, be that light on a hill, shining out the, the beam of the gospel light, that there is hope, and it's all found in Jesus. Otherwise, we are under condemnation because of our sin. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We pray, we seek your face. We want to turn from our, our evil and wicked ways so that you will hear us from heaven. You will answer us. You will heal us and heal our nation. For that we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go to the Lord's Supper, and as we do, I'm going to ask you to do something. In light of the whole idea of praying, we did this a year or so ago, I want to ask you to pray every day for our country, for revival. I mean, that starts with you. Lord, change me to be a revival agent until the 4th of July. I'm only asking you to do that for a month. How many is it? Right here, say, I will pray every day for our country from now to the 4th of July. One month, I will pray every day, morning or evening, doesn't matter. Morning, evening, afternoon, all of them, it doesn't matter, that you will pray. Because righteousness will change the nation. And if we're always waiting for some politician to change it, it will never happen. Because it's we the people. We the people. If we are a righteous people.